uh, welcome to the latest in the Dolphin Discussions video series. My name is James Gutman, and I am the head of investment portfolios here at Dolphin. And today we will be having a conversation with my uh, very close friend and long-term colleague, Andrew Dodson, about the state of the crude oil markets. Um, Andrew has been uh, closely engaged with the crude oil markets now for I think a little bit over 15 years. Uh, he is the managing partner of Philip Advisors, uh, and he has experienced uh, with Trafigura, Arcadia, BTG, and Millennium, uh, a whole host of, um, of, uh, of players in the commodity space. Andrew, it's good to see you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much for taking the time to have a chat with us. Yeah. So when we first had a conversation about, um, about arranging to, to sit down and to do this, uh, to do this video for our clients, uh, oil was under a great deal of pressure, but nothing like what we have seen this week. And I think we, we really must have a conversation uh, about these recent dramatic price actions. So we saw WTI go negative. Uh, this is not something that's happened before, although it's not completely uh, unexpected. You, you have any thoughts on how we got to this point and, uh, and what the implications might be in the near term? Well, well I think there's a, there's a number of, number of different, different factors that, that come to play um, with negative prices for real assets per se, um, for negative prices for oil, um, and why specifically it might be possible with WTI um, and, and that particular futures contract. And then equally, um, some of the sort of the, 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 the factors that wouldn't normally occur to um, the man on the street, um, which are unique, and unique peculiarities with oil. Um, so if I can sort of start with, with, um, with the negative prices, um, with most other things, real assets, negative prices aren't a possibility. Um, but oil has the unique, um, the unique status of being a good that we need, um, but equally um, is uh, in the wrong circumstances um, outside of a controlled environment, toxic um, and lethal to the environment. Um, it's an environmental poison. Um, so, um, unlike many other things which are very easy to store, oil needs specific storage infrastructure, um, it needs specific transportation infrastructure, it needs skilled, a skilled workforce to manage it, um, and there is a finite supply of those things. So unlike um, metals, for instance, which if they are getting too cheap, you can simply, and, and you need to store them and you run out of conventional storage, you can just leave them in a field. The trouble for oil is if you have um, too little demand and too much oil, once the um, storage facilities um, are filled, um, you have a logistical nightmare. You have a bottleneck where your, your choice is either dumping things as toxic waste, which will come with the resultant environmental fines, or you stop for production. Um, and stopping production also costs money. It's 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 um would be lovely to imagine producing oil from a well as like turning a tap on and off like you do for your your water at home, but unfortunately um that it simply doesn't work that way. So there's there's a there's an incumbent cost, um and equally the the the, the um some of these oil fields once they're shut down as we've seen with the Saudis when they've cut production over the over the years for various reasons some of these oil fields are, are impossible to get back up and running um. Uh, and if they are possible to get back up and running, they may never run at full full um, state of capacity again. So there's a, there's a lot of costs in, in shutting production down. Um, so that's sort of oil in an abstract sense. Um, with specifics to the US and the um, and the WTI contract, the West Texas Intermediate contract is something we're sort of historically stuck with. Um, at the time when the contract was created, it made sense. We had a um, a large number of refining capacity in the Midwest um, that bought from that delivery point, and we had um, some storage controlled by various uh, various oil companies, um, and it was a fairly active and um, 
dynamic market. Um, the trouble is, is that in the, in the last 15 years, um, US oil production has increased most specifically by shale oil in the, and certainly in the last decade. Um, and that mid, mid continent um, infrastructure around the delivery point um, is constrained. So we have um, only so many tanks, only so many pipes, only so many um, customers for that oil in that, that part of the world. And when you see a, um, a, a, a surfeit of supply versus demand, um, you very quickly start to approach a sort of logistical constraints. So as the tankage fills in the, in the mid-continent in, in Cushing, um, the, the, um, the oil only has so many places to go if the customers don't want it. Um, so we, we've seen a situation in, in, the, in the US this, this last week where the, the tanks are nearly full, the customers who would normally be buying that crude oil aren't running it because of the demand destruction caused by COVID-19. Um, so there's no customers, but equally the, 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 the secondary customers which would be borrowing for tomorrow's demand, which is the tanks, are full. And equally with all these bits of infrastructure, there's the, if you imagine you're, you know, there's a certain amount of infrastructure that needs to be left empty to allow for the normal machinations of day-to-day -day, um, logistics. So whilst there might be 90 million barrels of storage or 85 million barrels of storage at Cushing, 10 million barrels of that has to be left empty just to allow for the, the tank movements and the-, the, the and there's, also, there's also capacity available elsewhere in the world. I think, you know, I think- Yeah, I mean- the problem is, is pipeline infrastructure as well, so- Yeah, I mean, yeah, the pipeline infrastructure to get the stuff out of the mid-continent is finite as well. So we've seen a large build out in, in, in infrastructure in the last 10 years, in the last decade sort of probably more so under the Trump administration because more has been green lighted. But for the aforementioned reasons that oil is a, is a toxic waste at a certain point in time or so it, under certain conditions, you have a large environmental lobby that under certainly Obama and, and under the Democrats had a lot of sway and prevented a lot of additional pipeline um, capacity being built. And we've certainly seen a large proportion of those projects green lighted under the Republicans. Um, I mean, I take your I take your point about about uh, the absence of adequate pipeline capacity. But in some respects, um, you know, Cushing is. You said before you said Cushing made a lot of sense when the WTI contract was invented back yeah. in the nineteen eighties, and you, know, you have some experience in helping to bring contracts to market. I mean, you, you were involved yeah, I, with the introduction of the Dubai contract. And one of the yeah, questions I mean, you've got to ask is, why are you why are you putting the physical delivery uh, for settlement on a contract in the middle of the continent. I mean, it made yeah. sense when that's where production was, but yeah. the Gulf Coast I, I think, world doesn't yeah, make sense yeah. anymore. I, th I think the, tr the, the, the trouble has historically always been that the, you know, we get stuck with concepts that made sense. Um, you know, typically there's a sort of a, a make-do attitude i mean if you if you look at the world of, of of oil contracts so you've had the dated brent or the north sea contracts which are all waterborne crew contracts right. so they're based on a 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 waterborne quote i.e you turn up with your ship and you get your oil um the dubai contract similarly um it, which is listed on on oh, well it's actually the oman contract on the dubai exchange or the dubai um pricing benchmark um these are all waterborne benchmarks, so they're very tractable. They're very, um, they're very, um, they're very dynamic. They're very, they're very quick to to to, to price in real prices, um, and they're not constrained in the same way that that, that a landlocked contract is. So, you know, if if the Brent if if there's too much oil, which there is at the moment for the same the same problem we have globally for the Brent contract and the Dubai contracts, well guess what, you know, where's the, 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 the distressed oil rather than having the alternative being to, that it's got nowhere to go, you know, as long as you can turn up with a ship, there's a price it can sell at. It might need yeah, to be so, so, so Brent can go negative. It's just going to be a lot harder for Brent to go negative. So hard that 
you know, I would, I would say it's, it's probably not a, not a re reasonable possibility at this moment, but having seen minus $40 on TI this week, reasonable possibilities are. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I, I think it's one of those things where all these things are into interlinked and, and the logic makes sense. Um, the logic makes sense. Um, most of the time we're now in a slightly strange world where, um, micro fundamentals mean the macro connects dis dissociate to the point where they 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 right. they they, 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 they make no sense because you know the marginal clearing price of a barrel of oil on the north sea um normally looks a lot like the marginal you know is is influenced by the price of ti but right now the wti price is is in a totally irrelevant is totally irrelevant to that because it's yeah. it's looking purely at the micro fundamentals is is there a buyer available is there someone with a tank available is there somewhere where there's pipe infrastructure available you know etc 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 and and you know ultimately maybe you know it comes to the point of who's actually got just a, a standard sort of like gas truck available that we can just put some oil on and what price will we pay them just to take some of the burden off the system right. So, so the, the marginal clearing price of WTI is just in a completely disconnected world. Whereas the Brent and the, 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 the other 70% of the world's oil that's priced on these, um, on these waterborne quotes is still able to reflect some sense of, 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 of real macro fundamentals. So, you know, as long as I can find a ship, I, I, I can, you know, I've got a, a, a reasonable representation of what the clearing price is. Um, you know, <clears throat> and to be honest, <clears throat> this isn't the first time. Look, I mean, I, I've, I've sat, you know, I used to trade nearly a million barrels of physical crude oil every day. Um, you know, in 2009, when you had super, the last time during the, 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 the great recession um, after the credit crisis, you know, people were struggling, you know, Cushing, the delivery point, had many fewer uh, uh, tanks of storage. Right, right. it's built up. You had the last time you had super contango as they call it um you know you had you had too little infrastructure against the supply of crude oil. Can, I, can i pause you right there because i just want to explain for people what's so so super, so normally a contango bound is the the cost of storage and financing so in the metals case that you said before as you said before where there's no lack of land to stack aluminum in the mexican desert effectively uh, that that discount between the front of the curve and further out is bounded by whatever it costs to to borrow money to buy it and then to to pay for a warehouse. A super contango is where you've broken that bound because there's literally no place to store it. You've run out of storage facilities onshore. You filled up the the tankers and people are just desperate uh, to find a home for it. So that's so that's where uh, the contango arbitrage has basically been broken. And the last time, as you said, that we saw that was in 2008 and nine. We also saw that in 1998 uh, and 99. So, yeah, so la last time we saw, you know, so if you look at these, um, you know, these futures, the, the, the contracts themselves, there's a large amount of oil that physically prices on these contracts. So historically, you can look at it. The world used to price everything in the, what I'll say, the Western Hemisphere. Um, or the western side of the Atlantic Basin, so the US and Latin America was priced on WTI-related prices. The West African up to sort of, um, you know, in Europe, um, North, North Sea European crudes um, were priced on dated Brent, um, or Brent, and the contracts loading in the Gulf, um, the Persian Gulf or the Arab Gulf, depending on how you want to call it, um, would price on Dubai. And then, um, and then, after the super contango in 2009, 2008, 2009, um, you know, I worked a lot with certainly the Colombians and many of the traders did to move the pricing of their, their crudes away onto the data Brent benchmark um, because the TI contract became disconnected from the, that was, it, it just became disconnected. So the problems with the, the WTI delivery point and the WTI futures contract have been, you know, they, they're well known in the industry. You know, the, um, they're, not, they're not new problems. The, the fact that it's a landlocked um, delivery point, that there's an infrastructure bottleneck, that there's also a finite number of customers. You know, effectively with the North Sea crudes, um, the Brent benchmark and with the Dubai benchmark, 
as long as I'm a trader with bank lines and, and, and the ability to find a ship, I can buy those crews and take delivery. Whereas the trouble with WTI is that whilst it prices 30%, if not maybe a little bit more of the world's crude oil at times, the delivery point itself only has storage that's owned by a certain few players and only a certain number of refinery customers are able to take physical delivery. So whilst the, the world has, you know, an infinite number of, not an infinite number, but a, a very broad spectrum of, of participants, once you get to the teeth of the, the expiry of the contract, the number of participants comes into a real microcosm, right. a huge subset. And that's not to suggest that there's anything nefarious that's done. It's, it's just that, you know, it's like making the whole price of um, something we take for, you know, <clears throat> I don't know, let's say, um, I don't want to be glib, but, you know, something like iPad prices globally being determined by, you know, five shops in, 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 in a particular postcode. You know, you, you, the world wouldn't, you know, you, the world would think that seemed like a fairly peculiar thing because, you know, a million two million people want to buy the thing but you're having five five yeah, and i don't think that's the case with w10 i mean actually something something which i think has gone less noticed uh, about the events with the expiry of the k contract the, the may contract sorry uh in wti uh just about everybody who is um sort of a i guess suppose an industry professional uh had been out of that contract um well in advance. So even um, even the GSCI, uh, uh, the passive indices had yeah. rolled a week in advance. Um, all of the trade houses had long closed out their positions. Um, speculators, uh, hedge funds, uh, nobody really is going to hold <laughs> a position straight up to expert because yeah, the risks I, are huge. Yeah, the risks the are huge. The people who were in there were, were retail. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's be honest, a lot of the people that, that hold that contract right to the to the end are those that those handful of people that can take take the that will be involved in the active trading of the fiscal right. barrels that relate to it. Now, perversely though, there is another there are another set of participants in that market that that that, that we have not discussed, which is um, short term algorithmic trading. Yeah. Um, and I have I have to say that they do participate in this. So given that they generally have momentum short-term modeling, they, they, they can exacerbate these moves beyond. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the, the, the moves. Anyway, anyway. Right. Look, um, the, 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 whole, the whole drama surrounding uh, this collapse in WTI, it's, it is, it is in, incredibly interesting. And I'm sure there's going to be Harvard Business School case studies written about it, um, assuming Harvard Business School still exists in the decades to come, but uh, that's that that for sure is um, is is a fascinating sort of event. But I think it probably can be exaggerated in its impact on the the crude oil market. Um, nonetheless, it's fair to say that uh, that crude oil is in a world of hurt right now. Um, it's not just that prices have gone negative in. Um, in WTI and then implied volatilities have screamed up to 400%. Uh, it's that you're looking at single digits for, uh, for physical offtake in West Africa and uh, in Latin America. I mean, these are numbers, these are prices which are just completely unsustainable. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, you've got to look at, look at it in, a, in, in, as you say, the, 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 the headline grabbing news of negative TR prices is, is one thing. Um, the broken benchmark is another thing. Right. The crucial thing is, is that actually commodity markets are very efficient at sourcing the, the mess out. So right now the, we can get sidetracked by, by a negative price, but, but the real news is, is that oil prices are low. Most production is suboptimal. You know, in, since 2016 to now, I was going through a few things in, in my head before we had this conversation. The US added 4 million barrels of shale oil production in four years. Um, you know, all of that shale oil production is sub-economic, clearly, at negative prices. Um, you know, but equally, the big offshore projects in Nigeria, the North Sea projects, which, you know, let's say a decent North, you know, break-even cost in a North Sea oil field of $15, $20 a barrel-ish. You know, they're, they're sub-economic. Like, sorry, I've just knocked my, my 
but that's all right, no problem. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think your I think your point is correct. I mean, there are, there are a lot of projects globally which um, which just don't make sense. So 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 what you have is this this coronavirus shock has has taken I don't know. Let's just put a number out there. Let's say twenty five million barrels a day out of global production. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Out of I'm sorry, demand. So that's roughly a quarter of global demand. And we all know that that's a short term hit. You know, we're not going to be locked down at this level for you know an indefinite period so let's say that in three months we've got two-thirds of that demand back so we're not we're not back to, to to sort of the status quo ante but we've we've begun to to ease a little bit in order to get through the next few months you've had to see and with 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 storage capacity filled the only way to balance the market in real time now is to cut mm. an enormous amount of capacity production which yeah can, that's and, and, and that will naturally happen. I mean, you know, look, um, if I was a U.S. producer, um, you know, what's my choice? I mean, I, I'm not going to sell something. At, I'm not going to pay people to say, look, my hat. So I'm going to stop producing. I'm Absolutely. Like, well, even if you're hedged. Even if you're hedged, you take that. You, 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 just you take stop production and you take the money on your, your hedges. And maybe you, you just, you know. Um, and de you know, facto, it, Donald Trump has, has announced that he, he, he's considering paying producers not to produce. Exactly. Which is the same thing as hedging. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, you've got this, 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 this difficult situation. Equally, a lot of projects will stop. There'll be a lot of sovereign production that, you know, yeah. uh, national companies will have to stop certain production. There will certainly be no investment. Um, the issue you have with the, the, the you know, so the, 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 the supply side will take care of itself on, over time. You know, you're going to evaporate through attrition supply you know it will shut it will that project will get shelved that company will go to the wall there'll be you know there'll be a lot of bankruptcy there'll be a lot of issues you know you've already seen jp morgan city and wells fargo a lot of the big finances of, of u.s production saying we're looking to set up um trading ends we're going to have to set up um, companies to trade these assets that we're going to have to arrest because the owners won't be able to read so they're just getting ready for the foreclosures yeah so there's so so we we know we're going to lose a load of production that, that that the world is very efficient at taking care of those things the issue we have with recovery of prices is that every day we live in this covid world with 25 million barrels of product uh, of supply um <clears throat> of supply of demand destruction right. we and and whilst we still live with the the excess supply we're building we're borrowing tomorrow's demand today that's right. So, you know, the longer this goes on and the longer it takes the supply to come down, uh, the, the supply to come down to meet the, the demand, the, and the more we accumulate this volume of, of oil that's that, that delta, that, that, um, you know, the, 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 the longer the time it's going to take to recover. So prices of oil, whilst it's very tempting to think, you know, it's cheap, it's cheaper than it's ever been, I want to buy it. The danger is, is that, the, the, the time frame to recovery is quite difficult. And the big question that I have, and there's something I can't answer, and I don't think anyone's really got a very clear answer to at the moment, is how exactly does this world look like after COVID-19? Because yeah. that 100 million barrels of demand relies on a large amount of flights. Well, you know, I don't see that recovery maybe for 12 months, if at all. People will be like, look at us, we're doing this via Zoom. Right. You know, maybe in a different world, I would have flown to New York to sit with you or, you know, we would have, you know, people would have, and because that was the norm. Now, well, and even, and it, you know, just, just think about post 9-11, you know, so yeah. uh, the first thing that happens is, uh, is you get security implemented that just makes traveling a lot more difficult. Yeah. So even yeah. if we get everybody sort of up and running, the fact is we're going to have quarantine or you know, uh, procedures in airports, which will just make it more uncomfortable, which will reduce the yeah. amount of demand. I, I yeah. saw another, a, a comment from Ryanair, um, the, the CEO, and he was saying, uh, you know, social distancing on airplanes is just a, a ludicrous concept. Yeah. And he's probably right. Well, well, it's ludicrous when you think about the air that's filtered. So it doesn't matter how far you sit from someone, you're going to get their air through. The, anyway. Well, but actually, the, the airline, the, the airline, the airplanes have, have filtration systems which are extremely effective. So okay. uh, one of the things that they've done is they've they've taken some of those white bodies and they've used them as uh, sort of temporary um, facilities for for, for yeah. patients. But I think the point is is that um, it, it's very well taken. You know, demand will recover. 
but it's hard to see, it's, it's hard to know if demand is going to recover to the kind of levels that we saw prior to this recession. I, I think it's, it's not even about saying, does it recover? Because the thing is, is that look, the old rule of thumb always is, and like, you know, I, I'm trying to remember apart from the Great Recession where we had a period where global GDP wasn't increasing year on year. And the old rule of thumb is for every 0.1% change in GDP, uh, 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 in, increase in global GDP, you get another 100,000 barrels ish of oil demand, right? So if the world's growing at 2% 2, 2 per annum, then you get another you yeah, know, right. 2 million barrels of, of, of oil demand. Right? That was right. <laughs> Sorry? That was right up until this year. <laughs> yeah, that was right up until this year. But the thing is, is that with this COVID-19 thing, maybe global GDP shrinks 5%. Now, does that come in a, a 5 million barrel a day lower demand or does that translate to a much greater demand? Do we see, you know, so, so the, 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 the path out of COVID-19 for the oil space is much less obvious. You know, there is, there is value and there are companies that make sense and there are strategies that make sense. But one has to be very careful because we are in uncharted territory you know the, the perversely in a world of cheap oil all the subsidies that are paid to do greener energy become less relevant so with cheap oil it becomes a very cheap energy source and we may feel that in order to inflate the economies as after this we need to be focusing in on 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 the cheapness of the inputs rather than the environmental impact. Now, I know there's been some social changes and things like that. It's difficult to predict these things. Um, but cheap oil um, might lead to a huge boom in, 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 in things. You, 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 you can't, it's very difficult to know. It's very difficult to know. Yeah, no, I think, I, I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, one of the things that I keep trying to, uh, to impress upon, upon clients in our one-on-one -on -one conversations is how how difficult it is to to have a real grasp on not just what you do, what you know that you don't know but what you what you're unaware that you don't mm. know so um just think about like the way the the market has reacted to this oil price uh, move over the past week i think within the oil trading community i think we all sort of understood that negative prices were extremely implausible but were possible um yeah. i don't think anybody predicted seriously predicted uh, uh that we would be going negative this this sharply this soon although there had been some some inland um grades in the u.s which had gone which had gone yeah and, and I, I mean let's not forget in 2016 in january you know when we touched those mm -hmm. well what at the time seemed historically quite low yes. price in recent history when we went sort of 25 dollars there were crudes globally being priced in negative, you know, certain crudes were negative during that period. Um, sure. Not many, very, very few, very, very specific types. It was, of it was very specific sort of uh, issues. I mean, it had, and it did have to do with deliverability and, and consumption. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but you know, the negative prices, you know, are things we have. But, we but I think if you, if, you, if you look at the way that the broader risk markets, you know, the equity market, for example, has responded to the, the, the hit to crude, outside of our little community i don't think people really had this on their radar screen so their response was oh wait what do you mean crude can go negative um we never really <laughs> took this on as a, as a possibility so i think what i'm what i'm what i'm looking at in the world today is just all of these things which we never really considered plausible outcomes that now we have to put in as well maybe maybe that can happen yeah, I mean, I mean, for instance, all the all the assumptions made for modeling commodity futures in the banks are probably wrong because they're assuming. It's funny you should say that. So right, so yeah. log normal distributions are truncated at zero. Yeah, because because uh, as we know, you know, so you need to take some of the modeling that they do in the rates. With. Well, I assume they do, but but you know, there there are there are myriad issues at a, at a micro level. But equally, if you have negative oil prices or low oil prices. You know, you have a rampant stock market, but actually, you know, a large proportion of, of, of the major indices globally are the, the, certainly in the US and in the UK, um, are not a large portion, but, you know, a significant part of that, that market cap in those indices comes from oil majors. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think um, people are, have 
in, in 20 years ago, uh, low oil prices was a boost to consumption because it was effectively um, a tax, it was a, a rebate to consumers because every time they went to fill up their gasoline tanks. The fact of the matter is that the, the global economy has changed and the share of oil as, um, as a part of the consumption basket has just gone down. Um, mm -hmm. We're more consumer heavy, um, oil prices in real terms just haven't kept up with the growth of the economy, which is, which is a good thing. Um, but what that also means is that low oil prices don't have that same sort of boosting effect. And when you've cut down on your consumption of oil, not because it's too expensive, but because you're not going to travel and you can't travel, it doesn't really matter what happens to the price of oil. There is no positive feedback from cheap oil. No, I, well, no, I think if anything, if you look at the US, which is you know the major one, it, the jobs created by the share law, right. boom, the, um, the um, change to the balance of payments by becoming a net exporter of energy or of, of oil, the US need, no, no longer needs to import, it's self-sufficient. So actually higher oil prices were beneficial for the, for the US as opposed to the preceding 70, 80 years where they were, they were, you know, they were, as you say, a boom if they were, they, they were, they were a good thing if they were lower. Um, right. You know, so it's, uh, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very difficult time. Um, and it's very, um, uh, yeah, as you say, oil, oil, makes is less less relevant it's relevant it's less it's less central to everything um but i think that um the ramifications of this 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 most these most recent moves in oil will take a long time to filter into the into the wider economy um you know i don't think that it's not just simply that covid19 goes away and everything goes back to normal for oil i think i think we are potentially looking at a multi-generational rebalancing event of, 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 of oil and its central, central importance and, and how it feeds into the economy. You know, um, you know, I remember when, you know, when early on in the COVID crisis, when it was really seemed to be just in, well, seemed to be when, when at least we believed it to be restricted to Southeast Asia and China, um, you know, we, we lost about 3 million barrels a day of, 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 of demand. Well, guess what? Then it hit the whole world and it's suddenly 10 times larger, somewhere between 20 and 30 million barrels of lost demand a day, a day. Yeah, and, then, yeah. you know, and this is what, and, and by the way, this is demand that has taken the best part of a generation and a half to, to, to come to, you know, this is, this is the, inter, you know, this, this, this demand comes from a sustained period of economic growth you know that's our children and some of you know our generation some of our time you know this is this is a, that we've just lost in a in a, in a month no I, I think that's right it's um you know the the aftershocks from this uh from this uh this this oil price earthquake we're going to be we're going to be feeling this for 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 quite some time andrew uh i want to say thank you very much um it's really been a great pleasure uh, having this chat yeah. and to catch you Thank you for asking me. Oh, it's, uh, it's always. And um, thank you to our clients for taking, uh, for taking the time to, uh, to join us for this conversation. I just wanted to remind everybody that we have some upcoming uh, dolphin discussion videos. Uh, uh, the next one will be on the, the bond ETF market. Um, we also have a, a, a beyond coronavirus video this week uh, that my colleague Simon Black will be, uh, will be uh, uh, hosting on video games. Are they really just for nerds anymore? And we have an upcoming, uh, an upcoming Beyond Coronavirus video discussion looking at the retail market in the context of, um, of an e-commerce world. So we have some interesting videos uh, to look forward to and I hope that we will be seeing you uh, or you will be able to join us uh, when they when they reach our website. Thank you very much.